I might as well begin with a story since I'm a fiction writer. This is the truth. Wait, hold on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah. about as strong as it gets. <laughs> uh, so, I was, uh, many book tours ago, um, I was in uh, Detroit and book an author dinner, and there were three of us on the dais, and at the end of it, members of the audience in this hotel ballroom came, came down, and they were you know, wanting to speak to different ones of us. And in the back, I see a woman with these shoulder pads, like first and second base. <laughs> and she's elbowing people aside, and she comes up and she's heading right toward me. She stops right in front of me. She said, Susan. So I said, yes. And she said, you give me so much confidence. <laughs> so I, I began to rethink her, and uh, then she said, if you can do it, anybody can. <laughs> so, so I thought I would tell you uh, how I do it. Um, but um, I'm, I, what I want to uh, speak to you about tonight um, is about developing character. Uh, not your own, I assume you're dealing with that, as we all are, but uh, creating characters. Um, I started, uh, I was originally um, at Seventeen Magazine with my friend Kathy over here. We were editorial assistants at the same time. and. Um, among other things, we turned out advice to the lovelorn under the uh, house name of Abigail Wood, and uh, doing articles like how to say no to a boy, which <laughs> <laughs> the concept had never occurred to me during my own lessons. But, um, and then in the evenings, um, just because I got a little tired of writing for teenagers, um, I started doing some volunteer work at a political campaign at a, a mayor, for a mayoral primary. And um, I came in, I said, they said, what do you do? I, I'm a writer at Seventeen Magazine. They said, oh, you can be the speech writer. <laughs> so I, I said, well, no, it's, you know, unless you want to write how to write a letter to a boy, I, I don't think so. And they said, yes, we need someone to write a speech on the capital budget. <laughs> so, you know, to which I said, what's the capital budget? And, but that was the beginning of my second career, which, which was as a freelance political speech writer. And it taught me a great deal about, well, about fiction, I suppose, <laughs> but, but also about, about voice. Because this was late 60s, early 70s, when everybody, all the politicians, wanted to sound like JFK. And you, I had to tell guys from, you know, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens and occasionally Manhattan, that the how do you say something? You're not John F. Kennedy. You're a monosyllabic guy from the Bronx. <laughs> um, but I also told them that I'm not Theodore Sorensen. So <laughs> let's do the best with with what we can. And it was listening to them explain the capital budget, which was not scintillating, but. I, I got, I, I came to understand what I was writing about, and I also was able to, to capture that politician's particular voice, and it was great training. Um, but then, by the time I hit my um, early, early 30s, I was home with two kids. I was in the suburbs, living on Long Island. Um, I was then reading about, I did some freelancing, but I was mostly reading um, about four mysteries a week. And uh, 
maybe I became deranged, but at, at some point I said, not only I could do this, but I really had a voice in my head. I, you know, it's, it's like, not like Joan of Arc, you know, you hear voices, but um, I, I heard a voice and um, like me at the time, she was uh, a Long Island housewife. She had two young children and a husband um, who commuted into Manhattan and a passion for murder mysteries. But while I just devoured a lot of them, um, she longed to solve them and kept pressuring me to write about her exploits, her experience. Um, except at first I turned my back on her, telling myself and, and her, you know, why, why bother? Um, who wants to read about a Long Island housewife? Especially one, a book written by another Long Island housewife. Um, back then, I think I, I saw um, novelists as either incorrigibly sophisticated, you know, friends with maitre d's called named Jean Claude, um, or else they were um, extreme. They were extremely sensitive people. Um, haunted by demons um, too aristocratic for me. Uh, you know, the Virginia Woolf uh, kind of writer. Um, and then, of course, there were the glamour pusses in, in the women's division, the, uh, the Jackie Collins, the Jackie Suzannes, um, you know. But I think what happened is eventually my need to write was stronger than my uh, fear of failure or dread of success. Um, took me about a year, and I was on the verge of taking up knitting. Um, when I realized um, it was not just a matter of murder. Um, Judith, because that was the character's name, Judith and I had something to say about our lives in the suburbs. So besides um, chronicling how she would track down a killer, um, setting her story down on paper would give me a chance to write about the world that she and I knew. Um, the sight of a, a mother lifting her toddler with the pads of her fingers so as not to ruin the manicure. Um, <laughs> The gratification at picking the first fruit of a tomato plant nurtured since mid-May. Um, that bombardment of dirty words from nine-year-old boys in the back seats of minivans. And a housewife's loneliness in the land of coffee clutches and the aggressive cordiality. And the, the saving grace of, of having that best friend. And also, I think that at that point wasn't written very much about was a woman's need for adventure. Um, there was a lot written about um, in the early feminist novels of, of, of the, you know, in the 70s, the beginning part of the 70s, there was a lot about the need for sexual adventure, which is one sort. But there were other kinds of adventure and um, things that didn't, um, and to me, had more um, feminist cred than somebody winding, you know, leaving a, you know, adult of a husband um, for some guy, you know, who was, you know, perhaps a little better in the sack, but was, you know, another insensitive lout. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I wrote that, that first novel. I had to choose whom to kill. And I mean, when, when I was thinking who deserves to die, I 
had just had some gum surgery, so I, I killed a periodontist, which um, was really very satisfying. And um, I, um, that, that first novel had enormous success. Um, oh, some of it was talent. It was really, it was, it's, and it's been in print, low these, you know, came out around Gutenberg's time. <laughs> you know, it's been in print ever since. Um, but uh, I had a lot of luck because um, it was published by Times Books, which was then a wholly owned subsidiary of the New York Times. They had never uh, published fiction before. I was their first novel. They had just hired a fiction editor. Um, and she really took this novel and, and went with it in, in a, a marvelous and energetic way and brought it to our pals at uh, Book of the Month, where it was chosen as a dual main selection to uh, go steady with um, the world according to Gar. So uh, he was dark comedy, I was light, and, uh, or bright, as I would say. And um, once that happens with the first novel, there's great excitement, which lasts, you know, in publishing about six days. Um, but in that time, I had a, um, I got a movie contract. It was a big paperback deal, and the rights, the foreign rights, were sold in about 30 countries. And so suddenly, I had more than a, a book being published. I had a career. Um, I did not then go on to write a series because this was my first attempt at fiction. I was really afraid that. Um, I would wind up with, um, you know, 35 years down the road um, and uh, writing Judith Singer Goes Hawaiian. Um, and I didn't want that. I wanted to try other, try other things or at least be, be not, put, not, not put into a niche at the beginning. So my second book was based on my political uh, life and it was about a um, New York State gubernatorial primary, a Democratic primary, so it was therefore a comedy. <laughs> and, um, then I wrote interweaving uh, stories about a wasp family from the eastern seaboard with a middle class family from Cincinnati, uh, which was uh, almost paradise about the history we know and the history we don't know. Um, Shining Through was a story of heroism set in World War II. Um, story, uh, another, yeah, you know, lots of different novels, espionage novels, and more of my beloved whodunits. Um, but I did not, except for one time, um, I didn't stick with the same character. Why? Because voices kept coming and speaking to me, and different characters kept coming and, and saying, tell my story, tell my story. And it was somewhat like that women, woman with the monster shoulder pads. You know, they, they kind of elbow the other characters who were vaguely in your head, elbow them aside. So um, one of them was a man, um, and uh, who was pretty much everything I was not. Um, he was half Catholic, half Protestant, a recovering alcoholic, a recovering heroin addict, born in Bridgehampton on a farm, male homicide cop. Um, and at first, I ignored him. I ignored that voice in my head because I thought, how can I possibly do this? Then I tried it, and it, it looked like 
when I when I read over the first chapter that I had written, it was as, as if I tried, you know, taken a lot of steroids and put on a plaid shirt, and it still it didn't make it. So I walked away from him, wrote another novel, but he was still there after that, and so um, I went back to him. And what you have to do when you hear a voice that's not, you know, the old thing, write about what you know, which is great advice for a first time novelist. But pretty soon you begin to realize, eh, you don't know all that much. <laughs> and also that you know about some things more than you think. For example, um, I, I had grown up in a, in a male, male dominated culture. I, I was married to, and still am, to a criminal, criminal defense lawyer, former prosecutor. Um, so I knew, I knew the legal criminal justice system a little bit. I, but I was comfortable enough in that world to, to take on this, this cop. And um, I have found that as you gain confidence that you can actually write a complete novel, you can be a little more daring in terms of, of which protagonists you say, okay, I'm going to write your story. Um, but all those characters were generally, even if they were tough, like the cop or like Lee White and Lily White, who's a, um, a defense lawyer, um, she, she was a hard dame. But they all had a sort of a degree of, of they were nice. I mean, they said, please, if, if they, you know, if they got into a rumble with somebody, they, they'd say, gee, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I broke your arm in three places. You know, they, they had a degree of, of social skills and courtesy. But then came this one, Goldberg Variations. Um, I had just finished my previous book and was living, there's this great idea-free zone that I enter between novels where I just read other people's books and play in the garden and have lunch with my friends. Um, one afternoon I was listening to uh, Box Goldberg Variations um, with Passion and Focus, which lasted about 90 seconds. <laughs> And then I got distracted. It's not a unique occurrence in my life. I, you know, a birdie tweet can get me going or someone sneezing half a block away. Um, this time the distraction was the iTunes app on my cell. Uh, the title of the piece, Goldberg Variations, kept scrolling across the little screen. And by the time it lost its hypnotic hold on me, I also had this I first, well, the first thing I said, gee, wouldn't that be a fun title for someone's <laughs> novel? And by the end of the piece, um, I had the subject matter. Uh, four Goldbergs, members of a family, how they differed and what, if anything, they had in common. I decided on three twenty-somethings and a grandmother. But as the grandmother started to emerge, I realized that no chocolate chip cookies were going to come out of this woman's oven. <laughs> um, that I decided on does sound like a um, cerebral writerly choice, so I probably should take it back. I didn't think up Gloria Goldberg, Goldberg Garrison. Uh, she came to me as she was tall and shape what you'd expect from a former garment center model. But she was more than stylish. She was really intelligent. Her company, a Santa Fe based business called Glory Inc. was a great business concept. Sending elegant trucks around the south and southwest with a hairdresser, beautician, and a fashion consultant. 
she's a great success, but she was so mean. Um, it's her malice that sets the story, story in motion. Um, she informs her colleague and her dearest friend, the man who's supposed to take over her business, uh, she's at this point 79 years old, that she will not, under any circumstances, <coughs> visit his lover, who is in an intensive care unit, dying of a stroke. So I'm going to do a little reading, just so you, I want you to get the feeling of Gloria's character. What had turned Keith Crimson with fury at me was not random rage at the unfairness of life. It was me. I, I have to acknowledge that. What got him was that I had not gone to the hospital. And this was after Keith told me for probably the tenth time, Gloria, you're like family to Billy and me. Plus, there had been at least five repetitions of, Billy always said, Gloria is my big sister. At one point, he asked, let me be blunt. Do you have some major issue about, I don't know, hospitals or strokes? And just in case I didn't get the hint, not 10 minutes earlier, Keith had come right out and said, you can go in whenever, every hour on the half hour, day or night. They only let you stay for 10 minutes, but, and then, my tragic flaw time. Instead of sucking it up and telling myself that sometimes, for the sake of business and or friendship, you've got to make sacrifices or pretend to be a caring human being, I was honest. Not at first, though. I dropped my voice as low as it could go, which wasn't so hard when you haven't manufactured a drop of estrogen in over 30 years. <laughs> it could barely be heard. I have to tell you the truth, Keith. I know you'll think I'm an awful person, but the truth is I don't think I can bear to see Billy this way. He asked for you, for Christ's sake, Keith said. He didn't ask for me, I told him quite calmly. You know that, and I know that. You were the one who told me he's lost his power of speech. <laughs> Not totally, I'm telling you. He looked at me and said, Keith made a repulsive sound, a mix of a gulp and a hard G. It was him asking, where is Gloria? Why isn't she here? I said, Keith, you're projecting what you want to hear. Good could mean, get me out of here, or God help me. Most likely it's an involuntary sound. I don't know and neither do you. In any case, the bottom line is this. There's no way I can be in the same room with someone who is on the verge of dying, okay? I wish I were a better person, but I'm not. I don't want to risk seeing anyone who's actually dead. I don't go to funerals. And besides, it's not because I'm in the older range age-wise. I've always been this way. Then I kept babbling on, which I shouldn't have. Most of the time, I pretend I have food poisoning. <laughs> Except that excuse doesn't work when someone has a second death in the family. Then I make believe I have a death in my own family and I have to fly out to that funeral. And you know what else gets me? I'm all for interfaith, blah, blah, blah. But the worst thing the Christians ever did to the Jews? Get friendly with them. Now you have to go to their funerals and see their mom, mothers, or husbands with freakish makeup jobs in an open casket. So, okay? I hate death. Comas are almost as bad. I can't look at Billy on a ventilator. God damn it, he asked for you. I know what I heard. If you think you can, he can really comprehend and explain to him, Gloria just can't handle this, Billy. But she sends you her love. You're in her heart. <laughs> so, <laughs> after that, um, Keith takes a, a walk, turns his back on a multi-million dollar sure thing. And her only choice is to pick one of the three grandchildren, her three grandchildren, to inherit. There's one problem. She, she barely knows them. She so alienated their, their families and them that she hasn't seen them for years. But before I talk about the other main characters, I, I want to give you one little secret of the fiction biz. The author is always the first reader. When I start to write a novel, 
I'm writing the book I'm most desperate to read. This time around, the book began with the title, Goldberg Variations, but, and Gloria did set the events in motion, but her grandchildren also had to be fully realized characters. True, Gloria makes a good first person narrator, but for my own reading pleasure, I needed three other strong and unique voices. To get those variations, you needed to know the lives of those three grandchildren, Daisy, her brother Matt, and their cousin Raquel. The word variations in the title is about the diversity that arises within a family and within America as well. Raquel Goldberg's father, Gloria's favorite son, died when Raquel was a child. Her mother is of Puerto Rican descent and Raquel was raised from birth as a Catholic. Her life has been tougher um, than her cousin's pampered suburban childhood. Uh, as the novel opens, Raquel is a lawyer with legal aid and lives with uh, the golden boy of Goldman Sachs, Hayden Ramos Cruz, probably the waspiest Puerto Rican in New York. <laughs> but is that a good deal for Raquel? Uh, Daisy is mad for books and literature and film and has her dream job as the East Coast story editor for Paramount. She scouts books and magazines articles to be made into movies. She has lots of friends, a good life, but she hasn't had a date in a year and a half. And Daisy's brother Matt is a PR guy for the beleaguered New York Mets. Well, with his life as <laughs> hope, right? He's fallen madly in love with a young doctor, but is she really the one? He's scared because he's so gifted at falling in love. He wants to be more than the cliched guy who can't commit, like his cousin Raquel and like his sister Daisy. He's looking for a life that has meaning, which is more than you can say uh, for the grandmother. One of my needs as writer and first reader was to get up close and personal look at this generation of 20-somethings, the first cohort who grew up in a more multicultural and tolerant America. I also had to see through the eyes of characters who come from a, gener uh, a generation less visual, uh, more visual and less verbal than mine. Um, were they as interested in substance as they were in style? I went from the um, third person, which I started the book in, you know, to get the grand overview. And when you read your own work and you find yourself turning the pages rapidly to find something interesting, you know it. You have to say to yourself, this stinks. <laughs> um, and usually that, that change from third to first may not do it. In this case, my 13th novel, it did work. And, but I realized I was dealing with four voices and how do I do that without, without them, you know, getting confused without jumping from cat. And what I did was I wrote the novel chronologically and one character stops and the other takes off at exactly that point. So it really helped work out what could have been a problem into a, a, a fairly seamless construction. Um, Gloria invites them all to Santa Fe for the weekend, and she's going to choose one and only one to take over her business. Um, that's always the bottom line for her is business. Early on, it hit me that Gloria was my King Lear. Yeah. Arrogant, forcing the three potential heirs for her kingdom to compete with one another for her own gratification. Except what I was really doing was turning Lear on its head into a comedy um, because none of them want the kingdom. <laughs> um, and so the three 20-somethings are staying at her house. Her grandson, Matt, describes it as so huge, he says, I wouldn't have been surprised to see a discreet sign in front, 
Hacienda El Torah, a reformed congregation. <laughs> so Gloria, elegant and very rich, tougher as nails, and more hurtful. But I said to myself, did Dostoevsky ever think, gee, that Resh Kolnikov is a lovely guy? <laughs> Protagonists do not have to be sweetie pies. You know that's the basis for every noir main character, every noir detective that's ever, ever been written. They don't even have to have a warm heart under an icy exterior. But authors and readers need to discern some quality in the main characters that holds out possibility. You and I need to root for them, whether or not they ever get to a better place. And with the four of them, I needed to root for them individually, as well as for something for all of them. And that was the survival of the family as a family. But was that possible or even realistic? You, don't, you, you may think you know the answer at the beginning, but this is, the wonderful thing is, you really don't. Because if it's wrong, you'll get rid of it, and if your gut happened to have been right, then you'll, you'll stick with what you decided. But um, as for Gloria, she's so estranged from her family, from her grandchildren, her children, her in-law children, her former partner, her ex-husband. I wanted to give her a shot and see if she would take it. So this was the only one of my 13 novels for which I didn't write an outline. Um, I wanted to be surprised about which one of the grandchildren, if any, would inherit glory. And besides that, I wanted to see how Glory's chance for redemption would play out. Um, could she take a chance? Even if she did, as a dreadful human being who was 79 years old, capable of anything more than superficial change. Despite what the major religions say, isn't it sometimes too late? <laughs> Daisy's the one who mentions a concept in Judaism called teshuva. Uh, it means return, literally, but it's about coming back together. It's about reconciliation. If you've wronged someone, she explains, yes, you have to make it right with God, but that's not enough. You have to apologize to the person you've wronged. And if they refuse to accept your apology, then you go back again. And if they fail to accept your apology, you go back a third time. It's certainly um, similar to what they do in uh, some of the 12-step programs. Um, but what I had been doing with setting up these characters, with their interactions, because every one of them reacts to all the other characters. And you get to see them both as individual and as, as duos and as members of the family. Um, what I had to do was create four different characters. And well, what is, what is character? Um, and there are some wonderful mysteries that don't that don't really that have protagonists who who are not really fully developed characters. I mean, Hercule Poirot, for example, in Agatha Christie, has his mustaches and his this and his that, but it's it's really a pile of shtick. I mean, the, the, she plots like a dream. Um, she has great verve and certainly has had enormous success, but her characters are not fully fully realized. Um, you have to, I think, that if you can possibly, unless you want to just do a snappy, um, a snappy whodunit that's like a roller coaster ride, that'll take you, whoa, um, you, have to, you have to know the person you're writing about. If you keep piling on the details, like a claustrophobic who eats bologna sandwiches every morning for breakfast, <laughs> who's a lapsed Catholic and a lover of, of Haydn and who wears custom-made shirts, that's, that's not character. That's not what character is. And you know what it is. Um, it can't kill a book 
but it will it will detract from its potential strength. You have to make the reader care, and you have to make the reader desperate to know what's going to happen next, which was one of the reasons I threw out the outline this time. You know, my favorite anecdote about the arts um, is about the Russian ballet impresario Diaghilev. He was working with Jean Cocteau um, on a project, and Cocteau asked him, what do you want? And Diaghilev said, astonish me. <laughs> and that's what I wanted from Gloria, from dreadful, awful Gloria. And also from Raquel and Matt and Daisy. I didn't worry about whether the novel's ending was going to be happy or not, whether Gloria came together with her family or went on alone on her own way to insult even more people. I just, I as the author, I as the first reader, just wanted to be astonished. And I was. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay.